supposed to be talking about barn burning, um, which I'm not worried about the schedule. I've got the latter half of the semester kind of done real lightly so we can back stuff up a little bit. Uh, these notes are for me to remind you. So for Faulkner, for Faulkner, read Friday. For Friday, read Faulkner's Barn Burning. It's shorter than this short story, I believe. Um, and we'll discuss it. Remember, there's a quiz due this Thursday by 11.59. That's the extra credit quiz. I, most of you, some of you, have taken it um, already. Uh, it's going to... I think I've got the automatic answer result thing turned off. Um, I go through each of them, and you'll really see it once I do that. Um, I'll put another quiz up probably later on today. That will be maybe some of the same literary terms or additional literary terms, as well as this short story. It'll be due Saturday or Sunday night by 11.59, so you'll still have several days for it. Um, yeah. Okay. So, I did not take a roll or anything. Um, <clears throat> So we talked about parable, what you know, how parables work and such the other day. Um, as you read this, I didn't say this in my first class, and I should have. As you read this story, look for words that imply darkness, shade, gloom, dimness, etc. And look for words that involve these kinds of things. Okay? Because you're going to see they start kind of building, and there's a lot of them. That will help you try to do what the people of Milford or the people of the town are trying to do as well, which is understand why in the world did you put on this veil and what does it mean? So the story opens with the sexton. That's the guy who kind of runs the church. He opens the doors, makes sure they're open so people can come in, rings the bell when it's time to ring the bell, that kind of stuff. He's standing there, ringing the bell. People are coming on to church. And he cries out at the end of that first paragraph, what is a good person who put God upon its face? And as soon as he does that, everybody who hears him turns and looks the person who were coming out of his home. Okay? And they see him. Slowly pacing, uh, pacing slowly his meditative way toward the meeting house. Okay. Notice we're not told anything about him there. Goodman Gray says, Are you sure it's our parson? He says, Yes, he was supposed to be somebody else's church, but that person canceled, so he's off. The cause of so much amazement may appear sufficiently slight. Notice, may appear slight, a little consequence. It's, this is not important. Why? Because of what he's wearing. I need to get a black one to, to do this. So, Parson Hooper walks up and we get this description of him. A gentlemanly person, of about 30, still a bachelor, dressed with due clerical neatness, as if a careful wife had starched his band and brushed the weekly dust from his Sunday garb. Okay? Notice the implication of wives, you know. So, his collar, that's the little white band that goes between up here. Okay? His clothes don't have any dust on them, though we're told that the weekly dust, it looks like, had been brushed. Why, why the weekly dust? Why that little detail? One, one reason, it's those little details that make stories believable. It, it, it makes us go, oh, okay. yeah, that totally makes sense. Why would he have weekly dust? These are his Sunday clothes. He doesn't wear them any other time of the week. So they get hung out of closet, you know, and dust moves around because they don't have air filters and all that kind of stuff. And so that morning, he brushes the dust off, right? What else? There is but one thing remarkable in his appearance, swathed about his forehead, hanging down over his face, so low as to be shaken by his breath. Mr. Hooper had on a black veil. 
Now, so low as to be shaken by his breath. Now, we're going to get a literal description of how low it is in a moment, but I don't think the literal description is right. So, we're told from forehead to mouth. Just a moment later, a little bit later, we're going to be told it concealed his features except the mouth and chin. If it doesn't cover his mouth, then as he's talking, like I'm talking now, what is not moving? But if I had this like this, and I'm talking and I say P, notice it moves. It's got to be over his mouth, okay? In order for the veil to move as he speaks. Just a little nitpicky thing that bothers me, okay? So, we're told. On a nearer view, it seemed to consist of two folds of crepe. Crepe is a really thin material, right? Black, which entirely concealed his features except the mouth and chin, but probably did not intercept his sight farther than to give a darkened aspect. I could, you know, hand this around because it's probably the thickness total of this handkerchief. And I could do this, and I could hand this around, and you could put it up to your eyes, and I can still make out bodies. Faces, nope. If you're wearing something, you know, really white, really dark, I can notice that. But other than that, it's just form, 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 etc. That's what he would experience, right? Farther than to give a darkened aspect to all living and inanimate things. So everything he sees is kind of darkened. If you know your New Testament, St. Paul says in one of the Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians, he says, now we see but through a glass darkly. A glass is like a window, okay? And that window is covered with dirt. Now we see as through a glass darkly. Now, here. But then, meaning resurrected, you know, Christians, then we will see face to face. That is, no glasses. How many of you have read the Harry Potter novels? I want to use a Harry Potter reference. Ah, oh, rats. Can't, can't use it. Because off chance you might read them at some point. I don't want to give something big away. I can kind of. There's a point in one of the novels, Harry wakes up. And he doesn't have glasses anymore. And he sees perfectly. That's because Harry isn't here anymore. He's gone somewhere else, let's say. Right? So, he sees, as it were, through a glass darkly. With this gloomy shade, gloomy shade before him. And the word gloom literally means like shadowed. And shade means darkness, gloomy. So in this gloomy gloom or in this shady shade or in this shady gloom or in this gloomy, they mean the exact same thing, all right? Before him, Mr. Good and Mr. Hooper walked onward <clears throat> at a slow and quiet pace. Stooping somewhat, so he doesn't walk like a good Marine, head up, chest out, ready to conquer the world. He's walking, head down, shoulders kind of stooped, looking at the ground. Hamlet is going to do the same, we'll see in a few weeks. Slow and quiet pace, stooping somewhat, looking on the ground, as is customary with abstracted men. What does that mean, abstracted men? We wouldn't use the word abstracted there. We would use something else tracted. Distracted. If you're distracted, what does that what does that mean? The tracted part, the T-R-A-C-T, that's related to the word for the kind of thing you drive in a field, a tractor. It's something that pulls. If you are distracted, you are pulled away. Right? Like, when I was in your shoes, it was really bad for one of those to be in the classroom. Why? 
I like trees. I usually like just about anything better than what I was doing in the classroom. I was not a good student, undergraduate, right? I would be distracted by something out there, right? Abstracted means something very similar. The dis means bad. It's a bad taking away because you're not focusing on what you ought to focus on. Ab just means away. Your, your focus is away. Why? As he walks, what's going on up here? He's thinking. He's, he's ruminating. He's meditating on something. Not mm, meditation. He's working through a problem. Probably this. <laughs> he's probably thinking, I wonder what their reaction is going to be. Okay? Yet nodding kindly to those of his parishioners who still waited on the meeting house steps. That is, he gets up there, he's aware that there are people there. And he nods to them. Why? What is that a mark of? What does that show? Respect. Attention. Right? If, if you know somebody, maybe you're not on the best speaking terms or really good friends, and you walk past each other in a hallway, and you say something and the other person doesn't say anything, what does that mean? F off. <clears throat> That's what it means. I don't acknowledge you. You don't exist. Okay? But your acknowledgement does mean the other person exists. Okay? So, he nods to it. So wonderstruck were they that his greeting hardly met with the return. They just kind of back up and notice the hardly met is probably overstatement. Excuse me, understatement. It probably means nobody acknowledged him. Okay. I can't really feel as if good Mr. Hooper's face was behind that piece of grape, said the sexton. Think about that literally. Just because he puts a piece of cloth over his face, does that mean his face, like the matrix, you know, disappears that's what he's implying so he's gone from being human to something other i don't like it says an old woman he's changed himself into something awful only by hiding his face i mean we could literally stop and talk for the rest of the 55 minutes of this class, just about that one line. How? How can that make you awful? And what does she what does she mean by that word? What do you mean if you use the word awful? Really bad. Louder? Really bad. Really bad. I'll get, you know, um, rate my professor kind of thing. Every now and then, like every five years. I'll read some of those. And it's like, man, this was an awful class. That doesn't mean what she probably means by it. She's using the older meaning. Full of awe. It doesn't mean wonderful. It just means blows her mind. The other meaning, the more modern meaning, is horrible, rotten, despicable. It's not just, oh, I don't like it. It's that on steroids, okay? Our person has gone mad. No, he hasn't said a word. And what is everybody doing? Okay. It's like Dracula, man. Get the vampire out of here, okay? What would psychologists call this, on this behavior on their parts? Anybody know? They're projecting. They're putting things on him that aren't really there. Okay? So, as he gets to the doorway, it's like people on the porch outside have been speaking, and it's like playing the telephone game. Word reaches inside the church building, and it moves down the pews, or up the pews, if you want so that as he starts to come in, all eyes turn. 
And he acts like he doesn't even notice. Top of the next page, 332. He just steps in, walks down the aisle, nods to the people on either side. Notice he doesn't have one side that's favored over the other. He nods to both sides, makes his way all the way up. The pulpit's back here, and there's a guy, an old guy, who sits in the middle of the aisle in a chair. This is the oldest member of the congregation, and this is like a, a seat of respect, right? He's not aware of what Parson Hooper's wearing as Parson Hooper goes by. And we're told, he, the old guy sitting in the middle, this is about, I don't know, seven or eight lines up from the end of that paragraph. He seemed not fully to partake of the prevailing wonder. That is, everybody else is full of wonder. Till Mr. Hooper had ascended the stairs and showed himself in the pulpit. Face to face with his congregation. So, he walks up, and he turns and faces everybody. That's what's meant by, obviously, face to face, except for the black veil. What, why the except for the black veil? Because he's not face to face like we are, or like we are. It's face to veil, <laughs> face to covering. Okay. I hated him, absolutely hated him, when we were all required to wear masks. I mean, I had ideological reasons, but also, I, it would be absolutely, it was absolutely impossible for me to try to even learn names because I didn't see most of anybody's face. Okay. That mysterious emblem, mystery emblem, I'm going to talk about in just a second, was never once withdrawn. We talked about mystery the other day, right? Something that cannot be solved, something that is inexplicable. The Christian doctrine of the Incarnation. It's a mystery. Explain how the omniscient, omnipresent God, okay, that is uncontainable and infinite, can end up in an 8-pound, 3-ounce, 19-inch baby boy. There's not enough duct tape, duct tape in the world to wrap around your head to keep it from exploding when you try to figure that one out. Okay? So that's mystery. What's an emblem? What's that? What kind of shape? The Nike, the Nike swoosh. Okay. If you see that on a t-shirt, you see that on a pair of shoes, what does it mean? It means at least one thing. Nike made it. What else does it mean? Why did Phil... Knight, Phil Knight. Why did Phil Knight choose Nike as the name of his company when he was making, when he began late in the 60s, making shoes in his kitchen using a literally a waffle iron and pouring rubber in it to make soles? Why did he choose Nike? Who's Nike? What is Nike? Greek? Goddess of victory. So why do you put Nike on a shoe? Because it'll give you victory. Or on a jersey. It means, you know, cue the old queen song. We are the champions kind of a thing. Okay? That's why. That's an emblem. Does the emblem literally say, I am victorious? No, it doesn't. It suggests it. Okay. So an emblem is an image that conveys an idea without any words. That's why I've got somewhere this. Before the advent of the printing press in the 1450s, you had books that were written, but they were handwritten. Okay, But you also had books that were called woodcuts. And woodcuts were made by hiring a carver, to take a piece of wood, a block of wood, and carve an image on it. And then you put ink on that image, put a piece of paper on it, press it down, pull the paper off, and you have 
the image that was carved into the wood. And they did that with stories from the Bible to make the stories available to people who could not read. So you see a bunch of stories, from, and you could look at those kind of like today a children's picture book that just has pictures and no words. Go to a bookstore and look for the uh, Carl the Rottweiler books. They're about a mother and her baby and their Rottweiler. And it's about the adventures. Carl the Rottweiler gets it. My kids loved them. Why? Because you can make them mean whatever you want them to be. Because all they are are pictures of this dog doing stuff. And so you fill in all the backstory. That is kind of what an emblem is. An emblem suggests things. We all wear, I don't think I don't have, well, I kind of do, the sunglasses. I don't know what it conveys, but maybe it conveys something. Okay? That mysterious, mysterious emblem, the veil, was never once withdrawn. It shook with his measured breath as he gave out the psalm, that is, as he read the psalm. It threw its obscurity between him and the holy page. Why? The Bible's down here. He's got the veil like this. He's got much better eyes than I do. <laughs> if he could read the Bible like that. And we're told, and while he prayed, the veil lay heavenly on his uplifted countenance. He doesn't pray with his hands like this, you know, head bowed. He's praying like this with his head and face up towards God. But the veil lays flat on his face. And notice, did he seek to hide it from the dread being whom he was addressing? The narrator throws that in. Is he trying to hide himself from God? Well, if you think about that on a literal level, that's stupid, right? Because if one has an idea of God that is even close to any of the religion's ideas of God, God would know whether or not you're hiding your face under a little piece of cloth. Such was the effect of this simple piece of crepe that more than one woman of delicate nerves was forced to leave the meeting house. So, you know, escort the weak ones out. Then we're told, long paragraph, he is a good preacher, not a great preacher. He got his point across. He did it through gentle, mild persuasion. He wasn't a fire in brimstones. You know, turn or burn kind of a thing. It used to be, where am I? J.E.B. is over there, right? It used to be across Middle Tennessee Boulevard, a Baptist church. Middle Tennessee Baptist. It's now Human Relations and Graduate Studies or something. And they used to have a bus that they parked out in front. And that bus was a um, red, orange, and white, something like that. And it had flames painted on the side, both sides. And it said in words, pulling souls out of hell one at a time. Yeah, I look, thank you for your eyes, because her eyes just went, Rip! oh my God. What does that imply? That souls are naturally in hell. But if you go to the church, we'll save you. Okay, That's not the kind of preacher he was. There's a, a famous American Puritan minister, preacher, 17th century, named Jonathan Edwards, who wrote a very, very famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he portrayed God as really pissed. I mean, uber pissed. And he held everybody over hell by a single thread and just kind of dangled them. Like, I'm going to drop you. You better be good. Or, oops. Okay. Scary, scary stuff. Not him. He's gentle. Okay. The sermon which he now delivered was marked by the same characteristic style, manner, as he usually did. He doesn't come in and do anything differently. But there is something either in the sentiment of the discourse itself or in the imagination of the auditors. In the sentiment of the discourse, if we go back to those literary terms, what is that kind of implying? In his tone. Tone. 
the author's implicit attitude to what he or she is writing about. So the sentiment of the discourse is his kind of attitude towards what he's talking about. Notice, there is something either in that or it's not both and it's one of these or in the imagination of the auditors, the people who heard the sermon. That did what? Which made it greatly the most powerful effort that they had ever heard from their pastor's mouth. So something in the way he said it, or something in their imagination that they're just floored by the sermon. It was tinged. So if you tinge something, what do you do to it? You can put that up here. You darken it. If you take pure white paint and drop any other color pigment into it, what do you do? You make it, make it no longer pure white. It's now tinged. It might be tinged yellow or green or red or blue or black or brown or pick any of the you know, other bazillion colors. It was now tinged rather more darkly than usual. That implies his sermons usually have a little bit of darkness. Why? I think Hawthorne is suggesting something about preachers generally. They don't stand up and tell you, you're just totally fine. You don't need to do anything to improve. God loves you exactly as you are. Whatever sin you're committing, don't worry about it. Everything will be, that's not their job, right? It, the job is moral, at least one of them, moral improvement. You could do a little better on whatever. So, tends rather more darkly than usual with the gentle bloom of Mr. Hooper's temperament. That's telling us something about him. What is his, at least partially, his outlook on life? He's a little on the depressive side. How are we told he walked meditatively? He's, his mind's always going. He's always thinking. Okay, And we're going to be told later, he has a melancholy kind of disposition. That means depressive. He's, he's down. He looks at a glass, and no matter how full it is, it's always half empty. So, it was, the subject had reference to secret sin. And those sad mysteries which we hide from our nearest and dearest, and would fain conceal from our own consciousness, even forgetting that the omniscient can detect them. The subject had reference to secret sin. He doesn't come out and say, you're guilty and you're guilty and you're guilty of a secret sin. What, you know, other famous work written by Nathaniel Hawthorne? Scarlet Letter. Why does Hester Prynne force to wear the big A? Because she had sex out of marriage. Adultery. Okay? Secret sin. And notice, those sad mysteries which we hide from our nearest and dearest. Mysteries, things that cannot be explained, things that cannot be known. Notice that we hide from the people we are closest to. And feign, would feign. Feign means desire. It can also mean pretend, if it's spelled F-E-I-G-N. To conceal from our own consciousness. Now I could say, how many of you have something that you try to pretend didn't happen to you? Or that you try to pretend you didn't do? And every one of us, if we were 100% honest, would have to go, yeah, notice, I'm turning my head away. Why? I don't want to admit it. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to say, yep, yeah, that's part of me. That's what he's getting at there. We would like to say, sorry. 
and pretend <laughs> that we can hide it from God. A subtle power was breathed into his words. Each member of the congregation, the most innocent girl to the most hardened hearted old guy, felt as if the preacher had crept, I love this language, had crept upon them behind his awful veil and discovered their hoarded iniquity of deed or thought. Each member of the congregation feels like he sneaks up behind them and goes, gotcha, and whispers, I know what you did. I saw it. Okay, And that makes them each do what? <laughs> Gives them the willies. Okay, But notice, what is it suggested that he creeps up and reveals to them? discovers their hoarded iniquity of deed or thought. Iniquity is sin. So their, their sin of action or thought. Okay, But what kind of sin? Hoarded. What do you do when you hoard something? You hold on to it. You know? And it usually implies... Another word for hoard often is treasure. It's, it's something you really value. But this is a sin of deed or thought that you're kind of like going, go away, God. I'm going to keep this one. I'll confess all this other stuff, but not this one. Why? Because while even though one knows it is a sin, it's still what? It still brings pleasure somehow or delight somehow. Maybe it's a thought about somebody that you know you should forgive, but you're really going to, no, because I hate the SOB. Whatever the thing is, doesn't matter. There's nothing terrible in what he said. Notice. He doesn't come out and rail against sin X. It's, it's very... General. Okay. No violence. And yet with every tremor of his melancholy voice, everybody just kind of shakes. To use an old phrase, his words cut them to the quick. There's another old phrase. St. Paul uses it. The quick and the dead. Quick means living. If you have a dog... And you trim your dog's toenails, what do you have to make sure you don't do? You don't cut into the quick of the nail. That's the part of the nail that still has blood. If you cut too far, the dog's nails will bleed. They can actually bleed to death from that if you cut them way too far back. Okay? So, it cuts to the quick means it cuts to the innermost living part. So sensible were the audience of some unwanted attribute in their minister that they longed for a breath of wind to blow aside the veil. Why? Almost believing the stranger's visions would be discovered. Okay, so so what? So what if instead of Parson Hooper, it's, you know, Parson Clark from Westbury? What would the effect be, we're told? What would the implication be? He doesn't really know. Oh, that's, that's not Parson Hooper. That's somebody else. Therefore, I can kind of discount everything that's being said. Right? Because the messenger, the person bringing the message, we often place a whole lot of trust in the message in that. Pick somebody you highly respect. Then pick somebody you have no respect for. And both people deliver to you the same message. Who are you going to believe? The one you highly respect. The other one you're going to say, F off. <laughs> I don't believe you. Even though it's the exact same message. Okay? So, service ends. And how are we told the people leave? Let me rephrase that. Assume you go to church, whether you do or not, it's irrelevant. Assume you go to church, how should you get up and leave? Calmly, 
quietly. Okay. Class, the way most of you, when which class, uh, when 1005 rolls around, you kind of get up quietly. I mean, you might chat with each other, but it's not, you know, at 1003, you're, some do, you're, you know, looking for the door kind of a thing. No, they normally get up and quietly go out and then they start talking outside the church. Here we're told they hurry out with indecorous confusion. Like, get out of my way, Ashton. I want to get out of the door. Why? Well, I, I want to get as far away from Percy Hooper as I can. They're elbowing each other so that they can communicate their pent-up amazement. They're dying to talk to each other about what they just saw and what they felt. Did you feel? Yeah. Did you? All right. A few, bottom of that page, shook their sagacious, that means wise, heads, intimating that they could penetrate the mystery. They're saying, well, if I wanted to, I could explain what it meant. Well, what did it mean? Well, I don't want to tell you. That would be have to be their response, right? So, everybody else is out, and he makes his way out. Top of 333. And what does he do? He sees these groups of people, and he turns and nods to them, showing them respect. Okay. Puts his hand on the little children and blesses them. And what are we told? Middle of that paragraph, top of 333. Strange and bewildered looks repaid him for his courtesy. Does he receive the same kind of courtesy he shows them? No, he doesn't. You could almost go, ooh, another sin to add to their stash, you know. All right? He's normally invited to old Squire Sanders' house for dinner after church, and he forgets. So now what's happening? He's being shunned. All right? He makes his way to his house, he gets to the door, he opens the door, and he turns around and looks, and everybody is staring at him. Not a one has said a word to him, we're told, which is different than their usual behavior. A sad smile gleamed faintly from beneath the black veil and flickered about his mouth, glimmering as he disappeared. If something glimmers, how long does it last? Shortly. A glimmering light, it's there and then gone. It's kind of like he goes, damn. Knew it? Like, I got him. It worked. How strange, says a lady, that a simple black veil, such as any woman might wear on her body, should become such a terrible thing on Mr. Hooper's face. Her husband, Something's happened to his mind. He's gone crazy. And he says, you know, the strangest thing is that even I feel that way. Little, what does that tell us about this guy? He got a bit of an ego. I mean, even me. Well, who the hell are you? you know? And then he says, it throws its influence over his whole person and makes him ghost-like. Assume for the moment you believe in ghosts. Let's say everybody in this room believes in ghosts. You say they are real. And one suddenly appears in this classroom right here. What's your reaction? And I don't mean you think of ghosts like, oh, they just want love. They just need to be understood better. They don't really. No, I mean, you're terrified of them. And one appears. Everybody's going to freak out, right? That's, that's what he means. He has his ghost-like appearance. And he says to his wife, do you not feel it so? And she says, truly I do. I would not be alone with him for the world. I wonder he is not afraid to be alone with himself. And her husband says, men sometimes 
are so. He doesn't mean men, only men. He means people, humanity, are sometimes afraid to be by themselves. Why? What can the mind do sometimes when you're all alone for a long time? Samuel John have wild thoughts. Samuel Johnson, a poet and writer from the 18th century, wrote a little story called Rasulus or the Abyssinian Prince or something like that. And there's a character in it, an old guy, who goes crazy. Why? Because he spends all his time alone. And he goes crazy because he says, because my mind did not have something external to me to investigate, to evaluate, to chew on, it did what? It turned inwards. And it chewed upon itself. Okay? Now you can listen to... I don't have time for that. You can listen to monks and other people who have been in solitary confinement stuff, you know, like priests who were imprisoned by the Soviets and Nazis and stuff. And they'll talk about the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I was going to prison, going to solitary confinement. Why? Because it drew me inward. And Jesus says, look for the kingdom of heaven, and where is it? It's inside. Totally different, you know, perspectives there. Okay? So, there's another service that day. There's an afternoon service. So you have regular Sunday morning service, and then the afternoon service is what? A funeral. And he comes wearing his black veil. And they were like, well, this is appropriate. You wear black to funerals. Okay? He goes up to the coffin. It's an open casket funeral. He bends over to take a look at her. He's got his veil on. He bends over and notice what the veil does. It falls down. So he is now face to face with the corpse. Like if she opened her eyes, she would see him. Middle of, yeah, about a third of the way into that paragraph. As he stooped, the veil hung straight down from his forehead, so that if her eyelids had not been closed forever, the dead maiden might have seen his face. Could Mr. Hooper be fearful of her glance? That he so hastily caught back the veil. He bends over. What does he immediately do? He pulls up the veil. So even... Lying with this, I mean, bending over his face over this corpse. She's dead. She's as dead as this thing. He still holds the veil up so she can't see him. Okay. A person who watched the interview between the dead and living scrupled not to affirm. That is, didn't keep her mouth shut. that at the instant when the clergyman's features were disclosed, the corpse had slightly shuddered. As soon as the veil falls, her body twitches. Guess what? Corpses do that. Not corpses that have been embalmed, okay, because the body's been dead too long at that point, but somebody that's just died, somebody that hasn't been embalmed, even if they've been dead for 24 hours, the body will every now and then twitch. Why? Muscles are contracting and relaxing. Gas is being relieved, you know, removed, whatever. So we're told. He then goes from there. He goes through the chamber of mourners. He goes up to the staircase. Why? Because he's going up to the pulpit to deliver a funeral prayer. And we're told it was a tender and heart dissolving prayer, full of sorrow, yet so imbued with celestial hopes. We hope and believe that Sarah has been welcomed into the many roomed mansion of God, where she will have peace and joy and happiness and, you know, fairy dust and pixies and forever. That the music of the heavenly harp swept by the fingers of the dead seemed faintly to be heard among the saddest accents of the minister. The people trembled, though they but darkly understood him. 
They don't really get what he's saying. When he prayed, this is what they don't get. They, they get the part about all the hope. Okay? This is the part they don't get. When he prayed that they and himself and all of mortal race, everybody who is alive and who has ever lived, might be ready for what? Skip the next clause. For the dreadful hour that should snatch the veil from their faces. Okay, so the clause that I skipped. As he trusted this young maiden had been. He trusted she was what when she died? Ready to die. That means she made out her last will and testament? Set all her affairs in order? No. How do you become ready to die? How do you make yourself ready for death? I argue when I teach the class, my Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings course, the, the Harry Potter novels are all about one theme, how to die well, how to prepare to die, okay? And I think that's the appeal. Even though you, most readers will go, what? But walking through it, and they're kind of, oh. So how do you be ready for death? By not being afraid of it. The character Voldemort, his name means literally to fly or flee from death. He is afraid to die. Okay? So, he says that there is a dreadful hour that should snatch the veil from their faces. What veil? What veil is he talking about? Masks. It's the veil separating life from death. It's, yeah, it's the doorway that goes from here to there. That's it. That's all that he means. Now, we're going to get a whole bunch of different uses of the word veil. That's why it's a symbol. It means a variety of different things. Different. Each one depends upon its context. Okay? That's what they don't understand. They're like, what the hell is he talking about? What veil are we going to have to shed from our faces? Like skin? Okay. So they leave. The funeral procession goes on. Parson Hooper is at the back. And somebody turns around and looks. And the person standing there, what are you looking at? I thought I saw her, the dead girl walking hand in hand with the minister. Do, 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 do. I mean, we're in Twilight Zone night, right? And they're like, yeah, so did I. Okay? That evening, there's a wedding. Everybody loves a wedding. Well, I don't really, but so everybody loves it when two people find each other and get married and live happily ever after. And he shows up wearing the damn veil again. Not a good sign. You don't wear black to weddings. Okay? And he comes in, and everybody looks at it and looks at him about a third of the way into the paragraph, almost half. And notice the veil added deeper gloom to the funeral. It made the funeral even more of a downer than funerals normally are. And could pretend nothing but evil to the wedding. One of the wonderful things I love about the word veil, it can also be an anagram. Rearrange the letters. And you get evil. Okay. Such was its immediate effect on the guests that a cloud seemed to have rolled duskily from beneath the black grape. A cloud seemed to come from his body, therefore, and dimmed the light of the candles. Old English custom. Couple gets married. They hold candles as they're saying their vows. And you want that candle to have a nice good flame. If a breeze blows through the church and one or both of the candles blows out, you almost want to stop the wedding right there. Just don't go through with it. Why? It's not going to be a good marriage. 
and or it's going to be a short marriage. Not, you know, I'm divorcing you because I found somebody better, but somebody's going to die. Okay? So it's like the candles get dimmed. The bridal pair stands up before the minister. The bride's cold fingers hold somebody's hand. Unless they've been in a, you know, walk-in freezer, are their hands going to be cold? No. Generally, 98.6. Whose hands are cold? I don't know if you've ever touched a corpse. In the Orthodox Church, when we have funerals, they're usually open casket. And what the parishioners, if they know the person do, is they go and give the dead person a final kiss. Some people do it on the lips. I find that kind of weird. You know, I usually do it on the forehead. Or if it's a priest, on the priest's hand. Because it's cold. I don't mean cold like this is cold. I mean like this bottle, when I pulled it out of the fridge this morning, you know, was wet because it immediately condensation started to form. It's cold. It, it can give you the willies, okay? She takes her husband's hand, and her hand is cold, and his hand is shaking. Now, it could be because he's got, you know, second thoughts. He's got doubts. He's nervous. But her death-like paleness caused a whisper that the maiden who had been very early on that day is back from the dead. Take the whitest person in the world and kill him. And that person's going to be even whiter in death. Why? No blood in the capillaries. It drains. Lay the body flat, everything. Right? So, the next day, people are talking left and right. So his fiance, oh, now we're told. His fiance comes to visit him. And she's standing there with him. And she says, paragraph 26, there's nothing terrible in this piece of cream. That is, this thing doesn't have like, you know, Satan woven into the fabric or something. She says, it's just a piece of cream. Lay aside your veil and talk to me. And he says, paragraph 28 or so, there is an hour to come when all of us shall cast aside our veils. Now what kind of veil is he talking about? That's not just talking about the veil separating the living from the dead. He's saying there will be a time to come. The hour to come, yes, that is death. But what's the veil that will be cast aside? The persona we create. St. Paul, back to what I said, you know, kind of said earlier in the class. St. Paul said in Corinthians, now we see but through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Face to face means totally open. Totally exposed. It seems to imply, some biblical scholars say, that we will know those who are resurrected to life, so to speak. We will know everybody else totally. There will be no secrets. None. Just let that perk a little bit. None. Zero. Zafnada. Zilch. Okay. What does that also mean? Well, on this side of the veil, totally vulnerable. Why do we hide things from others? Because we don't. <laughs> we don't want to open up that vulnerability. Okay. So, she says, I don't understand. Your words are a mystery. Take away the veil from those. Make them clear. Remove the darkness, shed light. And he says, I will, as far as I can. This veil, he says, is a type and symbol. What's a type? A type means it points to something else, something in the future. And that's why I have these names. It's a prefiguring. Moses was a type for Jesus. Why? He led the Hebrews out of Egypt. He led people 
from bondage into sin and slavery into the promised land, heaven. Moses didn't go into the promised land, however, because of his sin. That's why he isn't a prefiguring a real, literal incarnation of Jesus. Same thing with Samson. What would the problem be with Samson? Well, he had this chick named Delilah that he was screwing around with. Big problem. But he delivered the Israelites from the Philistines. David, little problem of a chick named Bathsheba. You know, but yet he was a friend of God's. All right? So they point to Jesus. Symbol we've talked about, a sign. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence, like an allegory. You know, if I had up here the circle with the line through it and a cigarette, does that ever mean, hey, it's okay to smoke here? No, it doesn't. All right? Okay, we'll stop there. We'll finish. There's very little more that we actually have to say. Five minutes, max. Um, for Friday, remember barn burning, barn burning for Friday. We'll spend about five minutes finishing this story.